So I'm a commentator on Politico's arena, asked to give short comments about questions presented between now and the election. Last week, I was asked to comment about Governor Sarah Palin's performance with Charles Gibson on ABC. This is what I said. Quote, I thought she was great, smart, engaged, and tough, and my admiration for her grew significantly. Well, the next day, I found my inbox filled with not a little anger. Some suggested I had been a traitor to the man that I am supporting for president, Barack Obama. But I think this response is a product of an unfortunate binary way in which we think about politics today. We've dumbed down every complicated issue to a simple yes-no question so that everybody is either great or abysmal as a candidate for president. A middle isn't possible. And suggesting something in the middle, something good about someone you're not supporting, is often deemed disloyal. I reject this simplicitude. I think people are great at some things and not great at other things. This man was a great scientist. He would not have been a great president. This woman is a great performer and social leader. She is not a great candidate for president. So I stand by my not-so-controversial claim that Palin's performance was great But there's a separate and remaining question that I didn't try to address in the couple hundred words that Politico asks us to restrict ourselves to, namely, is Palin qualified to be the vice president? Well, of course, the answer to that depends upon what you mean by qualified. And historically, we can see that there have been two qualifications that vice presidents have had, either one or both. Number one, they've either had significant federal experience, experience in federal issues, meaning they've been focused on these federal issues, or number two, they've had significant executive experience, typically meaning they've been a governor of a state for a significant period of time. And the one thing that was, in my view, quite striking about the interview on ABC with Governor Palin was the suggestion that she made that her experience was in some sense normal against the background of this history. Here's what she said. Have you ever met a foreign head of state? I have not, and I think if you go back in history and if you ask that question of many vice presidents, they may have the same answer that I just gave you. Is that true? Is her experience just as good or better than many vice presidents in our history? Well, we can compare her experience. There are a bunch of cases which are just clear, clear cases where her experience is significantly less than vice presidents who have served our nation. For example, John Adams, Washington's vice president, and Thomas Jefferson, Adams' vice president, were both founding fathers, just about as much experience as you could possibly imagine to be vice president at the beginning of our republic. Aaron Burr, Jefferson's vice president, had been New York assemblyman, New York state attorney general, and a United States senator before becoming vice president and also before being convicted of murdering Alexander Hamilton. George Clinton, Jefferson, and Madison's vice president was the longest serving governor of a U.S. state. Eldridge uh, Jerry, Madison's vice president, had been a founding father, a member of the U.S. House, and governor of Massachusetts. Daniel Tompkins, James Madison's vice president, at 42, two years younger than Governor Palin, he had been governor for New York for, for, for 10 years. John C. Calhoun, also 42, John Quincy Adams, vice president, as well as Jackson's first vice president, was a member of Congress for seven years, as well as serving as secretary of war. Martin Van Buren, Jackson's second vice president, was a New York state senator, United States senator, and secretary of state before becoming vice president. Richard Mentor Johnson, Van Buren's vice president, was a member of the Kentucky House, the U.S. House, and the U.S. Senate. John Tyler, Harrison's vice president, was a member of the Virginia House, the U.S. House, and the U.S. Senate. George Mifflin Dallas, James Knox Polk's vice president, had been mayor of Philadelphia, member of the United States Senate, and minister to Russia. Millard Filmer, Zach Taylor's vice president, was a New York assemblyman, a member of the U.S. House, and a New York controller. William King, Pierce's vice president, had been a senator and minister to France. John Breckinridge, the, ele- the youngest vice president ever, elected at the age of 35, served with James Buchanan. He had served two terms in the U.S. House beco- before becoming a vice president. Hannibal Hamlin, Lincoln's first vice president, served in the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, and a governor of Maine. Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's second vice president, had served as a senator from Tennessee and a governor of Tennessee. 
Schuyler Colfax, Grant's first vice president, had spent 14 years in the House and was Speaker of the House. Henry Wilson, Grant's second vice president, served as 18 years um, uh, senator from Massachusetts. William Wheeler, Rutherford Burchard Hayes's first vice president, was a New York assemblyman, a New York state senator, a member of Congress, and member of two state constitutional conventions before becoming vice president. Thomas Hendricks, Cleveland's vice president, was senator and governor of Indiana. Levy Morton, Benjamin Harrison's vice president, was a member of the House and minister to France and governor of New York. Adlai Stevenson, Grover Cleveland's second vice president, was a member of the U.S. House. Garrett Hobart, McKinley's first vice president, had been a leader in the New Jersey Senate, uh, State Senate legislature for more than 10 years. Theodore Roosevelt, McKinley's second vice president, had been assistant secretary of the Navy and a governor of New York. Charles Fairbanks, Teddy Roosevelt's vice president, was a United States senator from Indiana. James Sherman, Taft's vice president, was a congressman. Thomas Marshall, Wilson's vice president, was governor of Illinois, uh, Indiana, for more than four years. Calvin Coolidge, Harding's vice president, was a Massachusetts legislator and a lieutenant governor and uh, governor of the state of Massachusetts. Charles Daw, Calvin Coolidge's vice president, had been controller of currency and the head of the OMB. Charles Curtis, Hoover's vice president, had been a representative and a senator from Kansas. John Nance Garner, FDR's first vice president, was a member of the House from Texas and a speaker of the House. Henry Wallace, FDR's second vice president, was the Secretary of Agriculture and Secretary of Commerce before becoming vice president. Truman, FDR's third vice president, had been senator from Missouri. Alban Barkley, Truman's vice president, was a Kentuckian who had been a member of the House and Senate. Richard Nixon, Ike's 40-year-old vice president, had been a member of the House and Senate from California. Lyndon Baines Johnson, JFK's vice president, had been a member of the House and Senate from Texas. Hubert Humphrey, Johnson's vice president, had been mayor of Minneapolis and senator from Minnesota. J, uh, Gerald Ford, Nixon's vice president, was a longstanding member of the House from Michigan. J.D. Rockefeller, Ford's vice president, governor of New York for 14 years. Walter Mondale, Carter's vice president, had been the attorney general of Minnesota, a senator and ambassador to Japan. George Herbert Wash uh, Walker Bush, Reagan's vice president, was a member of the House, ambassador to the U.N., to China, and head of the CIA. Dan Quayle, three years Palin's junior, still had had substantial experience in the U.S. House and U.S. Senate. Al Gore, four years Palin's junior and Clinton's vice president, was a longstanding member of the U.S. House and Senate. And Dick Cheney, George Walker Bush, um, Bush's vice president, he was secretary of the defense and a member of the House and the chief of staff before becoming the vice president. All but two of our vice presidents have had experience which is not even close to the experience that Governor Palin has. The two that had experience that's close to Governor Palin's were both Republicans. Spiro T. Agnew was a Republican from Maryland. He had served as a county executive in Maryland and was governor of Maryland for less than two years, but a little bit longer than Governor Palin has been governor from Alaska. He, of course, was indicted before the end of his term and had to resign his vice presidency. And from the 19th century, Chester Allen Arthur, Grove, uh, James Garfield's vice president, he was a lawyer who served in the Civil War and defended civil rights of African Americans after the war. His only governmental experience before he was appointed to be vice president was that he was collector of the port of New York City. So, objectively speaking... We can say that her experience is not normal. With the exception of Chester Allen Arthur, she has had the least experience of any vice president ever. But so what? Who cares? Everyone knows the vice presidency is a mindless job, if indeed it's any job at all. And that's true, of course, unless, of course, the vice presidency needs to turn into the presidency, as nine of the vice presidents in the 46 that we've had have become president. A 20% chance, historically, that they have had to serve. And, of course, John McCain would be the oldest man elected to president ever, 
with significant health problems in his past. That can't improve on these 20% odds. So we can say that there's a one in five chance that the least experienced vice president in the history of our country would become president, depending again on how you count Spiro T. Agnew and Chester Allen Arthur. A one in five chance that the least experienced vice president would become president. This, it seems to me, is the real question we need to focus on. Can we afford this? No doubt Sarah Palin is tough. No doubt she is smart or smart enough. No doubt she is courageous, both to launch herself and the career she had set herself on even before becoming a nominee, and for standing up to the Republicans who gave her that career to call them on what she eventually came to see as corruption. But... We are facing now the worst financial crisis the nation has seen since the Depression. And we are in the middle of a war, or actually two or three wars, depending on how you count them. And we are facing extraordinary challenges, including, in my view, the most extraordinary and important, the challenge of dealing with global warming, which Sarah Sarah Palin has only this year come to believe is actually caused by humans, despite decades of proof available to anybody who cared to consider it. In the face of these real challenges that the next president must face, in my view, the question we need to ask is, can we afford this risk? Can we risk this candidate as vice president, the least experienced candidate in the history of this office, whose true character is not one we've had the chance to learn by watching her for a year and a half run for president. She is a wild card. And in my view, not surprisingly, no doubt, the answer to the question whether we can afford this wild card is no, we can't. To risk this now would be a kind of recklessness. And we have had quite enough recklessness this century already.